All right, everybody, welcome to a special edition, Tuesday edition, if you will, of Second City Sports Zoom style. Zoom style. <laughs> I'm Lakita McGee. You, you can follow me at Keenan McGee on Twitter at, and at Keenan underscore McGee on the Instagram. I am Sydney Brown, a.k.a. Sid the Kid. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at SidKid80. Once again, at SidKid80. That's S-I-D-K-I-D-8-0. That's S-I-D-K-I-D-8-0. And you can follow the show on War on Anchor, which kicks you over to Spotify, SoundCloud, and wherever you download your every podcast platform. Wherever you download your podcast, you can find War on Anchor. Don't forget to download that iHeartRadio app. We're also on iHeartRadio. Just download the iHeartRadio app, search for War on Anchor, that's W-A-R-R on Anchor, and you can access all of our programming from We Are Regal Radio, including this one, Second City Sports. You you can also go on YouTube so you can see our lovely faces. Go to War on Anchor on YouTube, and then- War video. War video on YouTube, and and then just press subscribe. You can find all our recent shows, and also the other shows that are on we are real, real. We are real radio. All right, Sid. Uh, let's let's start with some basketball. We got a lot to get to this week, so let's start with some NBA playoffs. Um, last night, uh, the, the Celtics just had like hot shooting from all over. Jalen Brown, excuse me, led led the way, and they were able to kind of just you know keep the Raptors at bay. You know, Jason Tatum had 18, Kimball Walker had 21. Like I said, Jalen Brown led the way with 27. Just sort of, like, kept the, the Raptors out – just kind of ran the Raptors out of the gym. What do you what do you think, and can the Raptors, you know, catch up tomorrow and tie the series? I think they can. Well, will the, you know, Toronto has to come out more on fire to start the game. That didn't happen in game five on Monday. You saw their superstar struggle, in particular Kyle Lowry and Pascal Siakam. Both of them scored 10 points apiece. Uh, Boston, you had to give them credit for their high shooting. As you mentioned, like, they had four or five guys with 20 points or more with Jalen Brown, Kimball Walker. Jason Taylor had 18. But uh, you had hot shooting again from Boston. I know they shot over 35% from three-point range and has shot over 85% from the free throw line. So. Hot shooting has been the mainstay of this series. As I said before, Toronto is a complete team. Uh, you can see Boston, even though they lost the last two games before Monday night's Game 5 victory, uh, they, they struggled shooting the basketball. So uh, it, Game 5 was the story of hot shooting once again. Toronto was were unable to defend Fred, Fred Fleet for Toronto. He was the only person that scored over 20 points for Toronto. So if Toronto wants to extend this series to seven games, Pas- Pascal Siakam is going to have to step up. Kyle Lowry is going to step up, and they had to get more production from their bench. Yeah, bench score has been a been a problem. Also, Marcus All no points. Really, I mean, you can't you can't afford to. You know, they had like cold shooting all over the place. They were twelve for forty. Mm-hmm. They were also twelve for forty from three pointer, which that's not going to work if you're trying to you know def- you know defend your title. So they definitely have to get to get get it together. In that front, also, like you said, Miles Powell was the only one. Well, actually, um, Matt Tom has also had 10 points, but the, that, that bench has not been well produced for the Raptors. And that's been a problem for them in the series with Boston. Of course, you want to give Boston all the credit with their hot shooting, but at the same time, mm-hmm. though, they haven't, and you know, the Raptors haven't shot the ball well either, though. So that, that's sort of like a double edged sword there. But look, I have the Raptors in seven, so I had this. This will hopefully they can win the game, win the game tomorrow, and force the game seven because they really need it. And because I don't think the the boss that Boston can keep up with the hot shooting. I mean, if they can, I mean, look, they're they're going back to the Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah, like like you said, like you know, hot shooting has been the mainstay of, of this series. Can Boston keep it up? That'll be the question on the other side for Toronto. Uh, team defense has to be the number one priority, correct? Because uh, it, it showed up in games three and four, but in games one, two, and five, it disappeared. So they had to commit themselves to team defense, and maybe you had to double Kimmel Walker or Jason Tatum each time they get the ball. We always say this all the time when it comes to playoff basketball. It's all about matchups and adjustments. At this point, you're not running any uh, new exotic plays. 
It's all about adjusting to what your opponent has done. Can you adjust to that to stop it and to, or else neutralize it? And that's what Toronto is facing right now. Yeah, and it will, we'll, we'll see. I mean, like I said, this is definitely a must-win for Toronto, obviously, tomorrow, <laughs> game six. So I, I'm, I think they can. I think this, this Toronto team is too good. Like you said, Sid, they need more production from Lowry and Siakam. Gasol needs to step up as well. That the bench play needs to pick up the slack in case they struggle. That's been another mm-hmm. problem for them. So I think they can. I think you know, look, you gotta commend Brad Stevens and <laughs> for you know shooting the ball well and for his adjustments that he's made. Yeah, that's why Brad Stevens is one of the best coaches in the league, correct? Because he knows how to adjust and he knows how to plays to his strength of, of, with the players on his roster, and he gets a great feel of the game as well. So. You, if you pay attention throughout this series, that's what's been happening. So it's up to Nick Nurse, the head coach of Toronto, the reigning head coach of the year, to adjust what Boston's doing. Can he stop it in order for them to win and force a game seven? Should be interesting. So let's start. We'll talk about the other game from last night. Said so the Clippers. It was sort of, you know, they were up, they were ahead a lot. But then, you know, Utah came, I mean, Denver came back, and then Denver actually took the lead for a little bit. Then came, mm-hmm. and they came back, and it's sort of, it was kind of like a seesaw. <laughs> You know, the whole game was a seesaw, but some big shots by Kawhi Leonard and also that big middle finger block. <laughs> Talk about that. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the how, how Go figure. I know, right? I mean, I won't, I won't, I won't do it here for all who will be watching this. But, <laughs> <laughs> but listen, Paul George had 32, so like, he made some big shots late. Matras Harrell definitely showed you why he is the, he was named the sixth man of the year. Mm-hmm late last week's and Marquise Morris was actually, it was really good, you know, making some key, you know, key, key decisions and also, you know, a couple of key blocks. So what do you about, what do you think about this, that series, you know, the, the Clippers take a two, one lead over the Nuggets and Kay, they, do you think Nuggets can catch up? I'll take a second question first, like a traditional athlete. Um, can <laughs> they get back in the series? Sure. But uh, you got to have players outside of Joe Kitchen who scored 32 points to show up in the in the series. Jamal Murray struggled from the field in, in Monday night's game. Paul Millsap wasn't nowhere to be seen on the score sheet. Uh, Mason Plumley, uh, where's this additional score? And that did not happen last night. If you really look at the game, they, they, they were ahead. They should have wanted to be honest with you because I thought the Clippers were in the law, especially in late third quarter into the fourth quarter. But, Denver, you got to have, have players other than Jamal Murray. Murray needs to step up, which I think he will in this next game. But you got to have uh, other players as well step up scoring rise. Now, for the Clippers, Paul George had a monster game with 32 points. As you mentioned, Kawhi Leonard had 23 points, including that, that turkey salute block <laughs> toward the end of the game. So that's what Kawhi does. He's one of the best two way players in the league, if not the best, next to Jimmy Butler of Miami. So Kawhi showed his value last night. So I'm not surprised that the Clippers are up to one. Should Denver be up to one? Yes, but the Clippers, as we all said, they are a better team when they're clicking on all cylinders. So the Clippers, they didn't play their best game, but they did what they had to do down the stretch to win. Well, and I think that's sort of been their theme all season, even before the 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 stoppage, because you know that that's sort of kind of how they won some of their games. Was sort of like, they seem like they sleepwalk, but then, you know what, they wake up at the right time. And that seems to be mm-hmm. in these playoffs. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, look, look, PG's definitely has gotten better and better as the playoffs have gone on. So has, of course, Kawhi Leonard. You know, like I said, Marquise Morris has been really good. Um, I mean, it's sort of one of those things where I think, you know, what they – Doc, Doc – you know, Doc, this isn't Doc, Doc Rivers' first rodeo, so he knows what to do and what adjustment needs to be made. As for Denver, like you said, I mean, look, look, Joe Gitch had like a, a wrist injury, so a lot of people thought that maybe he wouldn't even play. The fact that he scored 32, I think that wrist is doing pretty well. Um, Jamal, <laughs> Jamal Murray didn't have his best game, but, you know, he had 14, but that's fine. But, you know, Paul, you know, you know, Paul Millsap, you know, where are you? you? You scored 11, but you were absent late. Uh, Michael Porter Jr., but he, you know, he scored 18 off the bench, but he wasn't out there in those you know, crucial mm-hmm. minutes. So you kind of wonder what was Mike Malone's mindset there by doing that. But like you said, I think they need more bench production. I think, you know, Millsap needs to step it up. I think, you know, I, I think Murray, Murray will be fine. I think he kind of, you know, was sort of like still a little bit fatigued, so he might have had an off night. But 
look, I think a lot of people thought that maybe this would be a, a gentleman's sweep, you know, five games, but I think Denver's shown that they're pretty scrappy and they could push this to six or seven. Yeah, that's why I had the Clippers in six. Denver, they're too much of a good team to go out, like you said, in the gym, gentleman's sweep. So I expect another a huge uh, game from Jamal Murray. Hopefully it'll, it'll be on Wednesday night so to tie the series at two because if they go down three to one, not saying the series is over, go tell them they're headed there for the experience <laughs> yeah. in the last round against Utah, but it'll be a tough road to climb again uh, should that scenario happen. So you, you got away with it against Utah, but against the better team and the Clippers, should that scenario happen, trailing 3-1 if you lose game four, it's going to be awfully tough. So Denver is it's a must game for Denver tomorrow night in, oh, in yeah. game four. Like you said, Murray has to step up, step okay. up. Jeremy Grant. Michael Porter Jr. had a great game, but like you said, he didn't He didn't have enough minutes. I would lo love to see him out there uh, during the fourth quarter, but uh, that didn't happen. So, But for Denver, it's all about adjustments, as we said before. Let's see if they can adjust and, and their key uh, role players step up and step up big. Well, we just to see what happens there. I think this will probably be – I think – like I, said, I think this will be a lot better series than a lot of people are willing to admit so. Tomorrow's game should be a lot mm -hmm. of fun, and like you said, Sid, I mean, not necessarily a must-win, but at the same time, though, you don't want to be down 3-1 against the Clippers because you're not going to be able to get away with that like it did against Utah in the last round. So mm -hmm. it should be fun. Let's talk about today's games. You got Miami and Milwaukee. We'll do that up first. Miami, you know, missed a chance to sort of, you know, go for the knockout punch. You know, Giannis doesn't like he's going to be. Although I don't think he's, I don't think that he's been officially get last I last I saw. But it doesn't like like that he'll be able to play. But you know, Chris Middleton, you know, they he did his thing. You know, and all the all the other guys stepped up for the for the Bucks. What do you think? And can Milwaukee kind of make this a series? It's going to be tough. Even if Giannis plays in Game Five, I. I how much he's going to give you, how much is that ankle? Of course, we all know there's not 100%. It's never going to be until next season. But with that being said, how much can Giannis give you? And can the other role players, like you mentioned, Chris Middleton, Kyle Korver, Brooke Lopez, how much can they give? Again, some of that Giannis is not going to be there. And what about uh, Eric Bledsoe and some of the other role players, Wes Matthews? How much can they give once again? Because let's be honest, they were playing off of, off of adrenaline. Uh, when Giannis went down, oh, okay, we got to step up. And plus, we, we were trailing 3 nothing in the series. So they made a few plays late, and they got into overtime. They made a few big plays late again in that OT. But you got to ask them now, assuming that Giannis doesn't play, you have to ask those players to step it up for a full 48 minutes. Can they do that? I'm not going to say it's impossible, but you're really asking a lot. Yeah, that's why I think if you're if you're in Miami, you better you you better go for a knockout blow tonight because if if yes. the Bucks somehow win this game, they're gonna have all the confidence and you're gonna be in big trouble. And you know, Jimmy Butler, I'm sure, will not be in a very good mood. He only scored 17. I think he only scored like two mm -hmm. points in the uh, in the overtime, so that didn't help. I mean, Bama Bio, you had 26. He did his thing. Goran Dragic, you know, did his thing. He had 17. Also, Jay Crowder had 18. So I don't think that was a problem. I think, like I said, Jimmy Butler struggled. So I think that played a, a huge part too. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that, look, this is, again, you know, talking about a coach is not a coach's first rodeo. I mean, Eric Spoelstra's been doing this for years now. I always feel like he doesn't yes. get his due. I, I think he'll be prepared for either scenario, whether Giannis plays or not. Like you said, I mean, I think the buck. I think the Bucks sort of played off adrenaline. They they had like wake up and say, "Oh, wait a minute, we may have to. Yeah, we better you know get up. We don't want to get swept out." So, I, I think Eric Spoelstra will have them have his his guys ready, and I think the Heat somehow pull this out. Yeah, I can not agree with you more, Lakina. Eric Spoelstra is one of the underrated underrated uh, coaches in the NBA. He doesn't get enough credit, uh, and it go and it goes back to the LeBron James. Dwayne Wade, uh, Chris Bosh era, of course, many people were, were upset when that uh, super team happened, but you had to have a coach to coach them. And Eric Spolster comes from the Pat Riley coaching tree, and he adapts to what he has on the on the on on his roster. He's a great tactician. He, he knows what to do. And we will talk about this year's Miami team. As we mentioned the last few weeks, Lakino, on this program, and for the, for the teams that could potentially give Milwaukee trouble, 
Miami was it. And you, like you said, Jimmy Butler didn't have a great game on Sunday in game four, but uh, you mentioned that all the other players that stepped up, Jay Crowder, Duncan Robinson, Bam Amabayo, who was a first-time All-Star this year, they all played their roles. They're going to have to do that to get in, do that again in Game Five. Now, the, the problem is for Milwaukee, as I said, can they give that effort for a full 48 minutes? Can they have their offense uh, shoot consistently well? Because right now, I, I I don't see it. Miami still has the momentum. Yes, you are real close for closing it out in Game Four, especially after the. Giannis injury, but I think Miami smells smells blood. I think they'll get it done in Game Five. Yeah, I'm I'm with you today. I, I just don't see the Bucks, especially if we know Giannis wasn't 100 percent before the playoffs start. Well, before at least before this series started, and you know, mm-hmm. he made have might have made it worse. And I'm sure the doctors will probably tell him that I think his best bet would be to sit down. So. I, I just don't see the, the, the supporting cast. As good as they are, I don't think they'll be able to do this for three more games. I just don't think they can do it. So I think I, I think it woke up Miami. I think they'll, they'll go for the knockout blow, and I think they'll, I think they'll, they'll end it tonight. Just my prediction. <laughs> All right. Um, the Lakers and the Rockets. Turns out that these two teams are, are totally different. But yet, somehow, <laughs> you think? <laughs> yeah, but yet somehow they're evenly matched, and you know all three games were, you know, were, were have been thrillers, sort of like a different styles. But you know, Anthony Davis was able to, you know, step it up in game game three and sort of like give him that sort of like that. I mean, game two and you know, sort of sort of give, you know, give. Mm-hmm excuse me, the Lakers, that edge to sort of, you know, win game two and even the series. Where do you see this? I still have the Lakers winning this series in six. We all know that James Harden has the potential to go off to, and take over again. I'm still waiting for that performance. Maybe it'll be in game three tonight. But watching that game on Sunday, uh, the Lakers came out well. LeBron James turned back the clock with two alley-oops from Alex Caruso. Uh, LeBron showed up, like you mentioned, a- AD Anthony Davis. He played this role. JaVale McGee uh, bringing the energy both on the bench and on the floor. I know he was mic'd up for, for game two. So uh, he's been doing well, especially on the defensive end. But the problems that I have with the Lakers, that's been a concern all year. They cannot shoot the three-point well, yeah. and they cannot defend the three. Yeah. And this is when uh, the, the absence of Avery Bradley will come into play. So when they get by the Rockets, of the absence of Avery Bradley will be felt in the next round, assuming that they meet the Clippers in the Western Conference Finals. Yeah, and I think that's the one, if you're a Lakers fan, I think that's the one thing that concerns you. You're, you're 12, 12 for 27 from three. That's not going to do it if you're trying to win a title. So especially mm-hmm. if you've got a team that's shooting, that shoots the, the three well, like Houston, and should they play the Clippers, mm-hmm. the Clippers as well. So, I mean – I think right now, I mean, as long as both AD and LeBron are, you know, sort of like the nice you know, one-two combo, if, you know, AD does his thing and LeBron, you know, turns back the clock and does his thing, I think they'll be fine. Remember in game one, I think they only scored combined like 42. That's not going to do mm-hmm. if, you're to, if you're trying to win so, win the series in game two. In game one, I should say, they scored like 42. But then in game two, they had – 60, 62, so that was a lot better. Of 62 of their 117 points came from AD and LeBron, so that definitely helps helps their cause as well. Um, Markeith Morris had 16 off the bench, so that that helps too. Had a little bit of playoff Rondo, you know, had scored 10 points, you know, had a couple of you know mm-hmm. steals, but you know that that should help a little bit as well for them in that aspect. Maybe sort of offset not having Avery, Avery Bradley. If you're the Rockets, I mean, look, James, you know, James Harden, Eric Gordon, but you know, Russell, Russell, Russell only had ten points. He struggled mildly from three. He was only one for seven. So that's not going to do it if you're trying to. It worked in game one for them, but it didn't work in game two. So I think maybe a little bit of defense adjustment that Mike, Frank Vogel showed through the Lakers. I think that sort of led to Westbrook struggles. As I was watching that game. This will be a very interesting, you know, game three. So you see which one of these teams can sort of dominate their particular styles. Going back to the Lakers for a moment, as you mentioned, playoff Rondo, Ryan John Rondo. I know he hates that that name, but 
Uh, you have <laughs> players like that. You have players like that, that that knows what to do. They knows their role, and they show up in the most crucial times. We saw that well in his championship year with Boston in '08, and when they tried to go back to the finals a couple of years later, he showed up then. You saw that when he was here in Chicago with the Bulls. Let's be honest, too. They caught a break when, uh, unfortunately, Isaiah Thomas, the young Isaiah Thomas, uh, his sister passed away in a tragic accident, and the Bulls uh, caught him red-handed. And of course, took the 2-0 series lead. And of course, they lost the rest of the rest of the games in that series a few years ago. And also, what Rondo did in New Orleans a couple years ago when they upset the Portland Trailblazers. So Rondo knows his role, especially at this stage of his career. He provides that veteran leadership both on and off the floor. And you saw that in game two. And like you said, Marquise Moore is nice for him to, um, to show up for once for the Lakers. The problem with that, that half for the Lakers, who else is going to step up scoring-wise for the bench? I've been asking this question the last couple of weeks. Are you going to get something out of J.R. Smith and, and or Deion Waiters? Kyle Kuzma, he's inconsistent. So uh, what's going on there? So – you had to have more production uh, from your bench, and that's what's going to help the Lakers uh, be a balanced team moving forward in these playoffs. Also, Dwight Howard. I mean, he was a coach's decision. That that's sort of like that. That's kind of weird, right? I mean, it, it's sort of yeah. I mean, it's all with J.R. Smith, so you know, will they be available? Either one will be available for Game Three. I mean, what's the you know what's sort of like the what's sort of the story here? But you know, again. We'll we'll see you know whose style can dominate. I mean, we all know the Rockets love the sort of small ball G three, and the Lakers are more run and gun. So it'll be interesting to see how how all this shakes out because I think this will go six or seven two because I think the I think Houston and the Lakers, even though like I said their their, their styles are so so different, but yet mm-hmm. you know, each in each case in both cases I think that they've shown that they've both been very effective. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. As for, for the Houston Rockets, we all know, as you mentioned, they are a three-point shooting team. If they shoot 12 of 25 or 12 of 30, they win the majority of the time. If they shoot 0 for 27 like they did in Game 7 a couple of years ago during that stretch against the Warriors. Uh, they usually lose, and they lose big. So the Rockets are sticking to their formula. But as you mentioned, in Game 2, Russell Westbrook struggled, especially in that fourth quarter when he didn't play that much. Harden had to carry the team once again. I know Eric Gordon had a, a few big shots in there as well. Robert Covington, a Chicago guy, he chipped in as well. But you had to have more of a, of a balance scoring-wise. And, and James Harden has to lead this team uh, along with Russell Westbrook. If you don't have a big uh, performance from those two guys, uh, it's going to be trouble. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, like I said, I mean, Russell Westbrook only scored in 10. I mean, like I said, he had his struggles from three. And that's not enough if you're trying to upset the Lakers. Well, upset the Lakers, I guess. That's actually air quotes. But <laughs> should be a good one tonight. We'll, we'll see whoever gets the advantage, you know, going to that pivotal game three. All right, Sid. So let's go to the, to the Diamonds. Um, the, we'll start with the Cubs first. The Cubs got a much-needed win to sort of stave off – to make it, you know, stave off that series with the, the Cardinals. I mean, I, you know, we said this on Friday. You had to win three out of five. They didn't. They lost three of lost three of those. But, you know, they got a much. They got their much needed win. Kyle Hendricks did his thing. You know, four strikeouts, only one or one, only you know, one or run, run only. I think like only one hit. I think, but they didn't score a lot. So I think that 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 helps too. Um, you know, Ian Happ is, you know, still, you know, showing you why he's probably should be, you know, the leadoff guy. Um, Chris, Chris Bryant and also, you know, Rizzo had a couple of big hits yesterday. Also Schwarber too. So I think that that sort of balance attack, I think they got that much needed win because remember too, I mean, they're well, they're still well ahead of the Cardinals. I know you look at the standings, they're like, I think they were like two games up on the Cardinals, but the Car- Cardinals got a lot of games to make up. So We'll see if that sort of, you know, becomes sort of like they just kind of comes back to bite them in the butt because they got – because the Cardinals, I mean, because they got so many games to make up. They've only played 33, whereas the Cubs, they've, already, they've played 42 already. That's a lot of games they got to make up. So, we'll see. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Uh, the Cubs uh, have the benefit of being in the NL Central, as you mentioned last week, looking in because – uh, the Cardinals have having to make up all those games, of course, with the struggles of the Brewers and the Cincinnati Reds as well. So they have the luxury to 
uh, get away with it, uh, for lack of a better term. As long as the Cubs can win series, they should be fine. They should be your NL Central Division champions. My concerns are getting healthy in time for the playoffs. When is Chris Bryant coming back? And your bullpen looks like it's starting to come to form a little bit. Uh, Jeffries is your closer. Wick got on the out there on Sunday night. He was eh, again. So uh, your your bullpen hopefully will start to come into form and, uh, and players uh, fit in their roles come come playoff time. Is Craig Craig Kimbrell, Craig Kimbrell? Excuse me. I know he's not the closer any, anymore. Thank goodness if you're a Cubs fan. But mm-hmm. is he your middle relief guy or is he your seventh inning guy? That's something you have to find out within these next couple of weeks because. Uh, you turn your head, you know, and, and by the time you know it, September 27th, the regular season is over. So you have to find out these answers pretty quickly. Now, back to Kyle Hendricks. He had a great performance on Monday uh, with four strikeouts and eight strong innings pitch. Now he's starting to see starting pitches uh, getting deep, deep into these ball games and, 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 and taking pressure off the bullpen. And you see that with the White Sox as well to a lesser extent. We'll get with the Sox in just a moment. But as far as the Cubs is concerned, uh, you're encouraged by the way Cal Hentress has turned it around. You Darvish has turned it around as well the last couple of weeks. So if, if anything, if you're a Cubs fan, you are encouraged by your starting pitches, especially your top two starters. Let's see if you can get uh, players healthy to contribute and, and, and contribute offensively and score runs consistently like they have been here and there these uh, uh, last couple of weeks. You Darvish had 11 strikeouts in that first game on Friday against the Cardinals, only mm-hmm. gave up one run. And I, he was, you know, named um, NL Pitcher of the Week, of the month, I should say, for August. Yeah. I think he should be right there for the Cy, NL Cy Young. Because I, I, cause I think the numbers, I think he has, I think he only has like a one, just under two, I think, ERA. So I got to look up the stats. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think he should definitely be like, at the very least, a front runner for... And El Cy Young, I mean, I mean, I know that people are, you know, there have there been a couple of pitchers I forgot, but I mean, I, I think, look, I, I think, I think you Darvish has shown that maybe this is a you Darvish we were expecting, and so I'm, 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 I'm excited. I know Sonny Gray's done well, but he's on a very good team, and I'm Mac, Max Fried, I, I know has done very well for Atlanta, but. You, you kind of all the the stats, especially for the National League, he leads in. You know, his, his ERA is like 1.4 or something. So that's pretty good. Even in a short season, that's a pretty good stat. So what do you think? Well, give, uh, give two thumbs up to Theo Epstein, the GM of the Cubs, correct? <laughs> that's one of the few free agent signings that actually has paid off. Of course, you Darish struggled in his first couple of years in the Cubs uniform. But like you said, like, you know, even this shortened season, he's turning it around and he's giving it, his team uh, the best chance to win. He was the pitcher of the month. Uh, we saw what we what he did against um, uh, the White Sox. He, as you mentioned last Friday's game against St. Louis, the one of the two games they only could uh, capture from the from the Redbirds. So uh, l- l- looks like Darish has great command on on the mound. Uh, he's not letting things get to him like he did the, when he first joined the Cubs. Uh, we all know that he was struggling mentally coming over in, in um, from the Dodgers where he lost the World Series. People were blaming him. We all know it was much bigger than that, and we won't get into that. But with that being said, it looks like his house is in order. and Everything has turned around for him. He's just focusing on uh, playing baseball. And you should be proud of your Cubs fan. He should be a front runner for the NL Cy Young Award, uh, Cy Young Award, especially if they win that division, which they should. Uh, his chances should, should increase. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. It should be very interesting there now. It's for the Cubs themselves. This week they have, I think, three against Cincy and three against Milwaukee, if I'm not mistaken. So this is sort of their chance to kind of like pad to their lead, if you will, and get get it going because next week mm-hmm. they've got Cleveland and they got Minnesota. So that'll be a little bit tough since they're vying for a playoff spot in the AL Central. Now, speaking of the AL Central, you're right, Sox, Sid. Didn't play the perfect, even though they did sweep the Royals, they didn't play the perfect series against the Royals. They've had, they had like some things that kind of went their way. They had a couple of errors that they were kind of able to get away with. That still scares me. So, but, but you know, the Lu- Luis Robert just showed you why he's, you know, should be right there for AL MVP, I think. 
So, what about your White Sox, Sid? Uh, as I said on Twitter, following Saturday's victory with the amazing catch by Luis Robert, a.k.a. La Pantera, uh, <laughs> as the late F. Farmer was a hang star on that one, that was a tremendous catch in center field on Saturday to perhaps save the game. And like like we mentioned before, he covers a lot of ground, not just in center, but both in right and left field. Uh, if we can clone him, he could play all three positions in the outfit as far as I'm concerned. But with that being said, uh, Jose Abreu has a hitting strength up to 20 games, if I'm not mistaken now. I, I know they're in Pittsburgh tonight and tomorrow. Uh, hopefully he can extend that personal uh, hitting streak. Uh, he should be up there for AL MVP. I know I've been saying that for the last week or so. Tim Anderson has been hitting the cover off the ball. He should be up there as far as AL MVP as well. He'll probably win another hitting title, hopefully. And Luis Robert, I think he should be up there as well as far as not just rookie of the year, but – but AL MVP as well. So hopefully the sides can keep it going. As you mentioned, not a perfect series against Kansas City, but as we said before, if you want to make it to the playoffs, could be consider yourself a good team. You have to beat the teams that you're supposed to be. They did that against Kansas City. They owned the Royals this year, and they should do the same thing at, on the road uh, against the Pirates before coming home for uh, coming home for three, I want to say three game series against the Tigers. And of course, Minnesota comes in here for a big four game series next week. So hopefully the White Sox can get, take care of business. They are a tie the top of the, of the division, as you mentioned with Cleveland. So uh, it, it's time to make another move. And if you want to be a consider one of the top teams in baseball, I know they have their best record as we talked today. Uh, you have to take care of business again. Let's see if that winning streak can continue. And right now, I believe it's at four straight games. Hopefully you can send it to five or six. I mean, sweeping a, a terrible Pirates team before you come back home against Detroit and Minnesota next week. Should be interesting, right, to see what they see what they do here because, like you said, I mean, they, they have Pittsburgh, they have the Tigers, but yet they got that four game against Minnesota starting next Monday. Mm -hmm. Then they have Cincinnati. Then they have a four game against Cleveland. So this is sort of their chance to kind of – they kind of like have an up-and-down schedule with some of the, you know, good teams with some not-so-good teams. So mm – -hmm. They can't afford to do those type of blunders that they had against the Royals, against the Minnesota, Minnesotas and the Clevelands of the world. You, you can't, especially if you're trying to, if you say you, you're trying to go for the playoffs, you're not going to mm -hmm. be able to do that. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. And I'm, 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 I'm excited. I'm, I'm kind of interested to see what, what happens here. Yeah, the only thing that concerns me for the White Sox is their bullpen. You saw the good, the bad, and the ugly against Kansas City. Steve C. Shack, I know Jason, um, uh, warned, warned, warned me about him uh, uh, because mm -hmm. I liked the move at the time. He's like, remember, he struggled last year against the Cubs, and he's <laughs> doing the same thing on the south side this year. So let's see if he could turn it around. I don't know if we mentioned this on our last podcast. If we did, so be it. If not, we'll mention it again. Ronaldo Lopez uh, was being sent down to Charlotte after that terrible start at Minnesota last week. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we'll see him in a White Sox uniform for the rest of this season, but he has to get it together. Uh, I hate to say it, he's our version of Tyler Chatwood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we wow. can give him that award. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. We can give him that award. Yeah. <clears throat> but, 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 but hopefully the White, the White Sox – yeah, the, hopefully the White Sox rotation can come uh, together. You have Giolito. You have Dylan Cease. Hopefully you can get Ro Carlos Rodon back. And those should be your top three starters. So – let, let's see what, what happens. And also, you have Dallas Keuchel in there as, as well. Let's not forget about him. He's been uh, the other best uh, pitcher all year long. Yeah, it'll be very interesting because it's sort of, you know, we'll, we'll see what the White Sox do. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I, I, think, I think they'll get in the playoffs because, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the win totals are definitely what helps them. We'll see what happens with that as a whole because you know the AL Central is still up the up for grabs. I mean Cleveland won yesterday. Mm -hmm. They're in a three they're having a three game winning streak. We may look we may see three of all three of them, you know, both the, the Cleveland, the White Sox and the Twins make the playoffs like ninety nine point whatever percentage <laughs> says that they're all right there. But, <laughs> but yeah, so it's it's still look it's still a free for all who wins that who you think wins that division, Sid? It is a toss-up. I know Minnesota is going through their struggles right now. Cleveland is trying to keep up. It's really a toss-up. If you if you say one team can win the division, 
uh, they go on a big losing streak uh, and another team catches up, they can win the division. So it's going to be a, a fight to the finish. I, I'm not going to pick a winner just yet. So, but uh, talk to me around this time next week, especially after that big four-game series against the Twins against the White Sox. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's definitely a big, you know, next couple weeks coming up for the Sox. So let's talk about the MLB as a whole. They lost last yesterday, but the Rays, I mean, they're like, they're on a big roll, but look who's behind them. We got the Toronto Blue Jays. They're, you know, they won a couple of the, couple of the road. They've been hot lately. You know, the Yankees have, you know, lost four in a row. What's going on in the AL East? Well, as you mentioned, Toronto's home, you know, took it to the Yankees on Monday. Uh, they were one of the teams that made deals at the trade deadline. Now you see that come to fruition. The Yankees, on the other side, they are struggling with injuries and starting pitching. And they are now six and a half games behind uh, the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. As we told you, uh, one of those teams you should watch out for for this shortened season. And that's coming to fruition as well. But for the Yankees, they have to get it together. Uh, it starts with their starting pitching in their bullpen. And they can get Aaron Judge and uh, John Carlos Stanton back in time. Uh, to finish out the season, they'll be fine. But if they don't, uh, they could be possibly looking outside the playoffs, not even participating in it. Yeah, you definitely need to get Judge and Stanton back because I just, you know, without them, I think we've seen what they've been without them. You know, they've struggled to score. You know, Chapman has given up a couple, have, have has blown a couple of saves as well. So just not good. Just not good look if you're a Yankees fan right now. But, look, the good news is that you still got a little bit of time. You still got about three weeks left in the season. So, you can kind of get back on track. Hopefully, I think Judd's supposed to be back, I think, next week. And I think Stan's supposed to come back two weeks after. So, hopefully, having them back can finish strong and perhaps maybe get a better seeding in the playoffs. Okay, going west, it looks like Oakland, I mean, looks like Oakland's starting to pull away. I mean, they've had their struggles lately, but... Like the Cubs in the NL Central, the good news is like everyone else has struggled. The Astros have lost five in a row. The Mariners trying to make a push, but it doesn't. It, it's probably too late for them. They're, they're under five hundred. Where do you see the the AL West? I'm really this close <laughs> to giving uh, the AL West title to Oakland. As you mentioned, Houston has had their struggles, especially on the road all year long. Mm -hmm. So. But if, if you're Oakland then uh, uh, you keep beating up on Houston, you will grab that, that division. The problem is Houston, they can, they're consistently inconsistent. Can they get it together perhaps? Make the playoffs? I think they can. But, but your hopes for the division is really uh, slipping away really fast. Very fast. And so we'll, we'll see. I mean, they may – I think they'll, they'll get in the playoffs, the Astros, but I just don't see them winning the division. They're going to have to – I know they still got like a couple of series left against the A's, so we'll see what what they can do. All right, going to the NL, you got the East, you got Atlanta, but look who's behind them. You know they they too got a lot of games to make up for, but the Phillies have won seven of the last ten, and they've got some games to make up too. So we'll see. And the Marlins are still sort of hanging around a little bit. Where do you see the NL East? I still believe that the Atlanta Braves are the best team in that division. As you mentioned, Philadelphia has been hot as of late. Now, Philadelphia faces the same scenario as the St. Louis Cardinals. They have all these games to make up. Will fatigue be a factor? I believe it will be for Philadelphia, even though they have a veteran manager in, in Joel Girardi, a one-time former Cub. You still have Bryce Harper starting to come around a little bit. But they're, they're starting to pitch, as we talked about last week, Lakina and Jake Garrietta, he gave up those 10 runs against Atlanta last Sunday night. So uh, that, that's been their problem all year. So I think Philadelphia can make it interesting, but I don't think they have enough to overtake Atlanta, especially as you mentioned with all those games that have to make up in the next week or so. I think they still, I think they still make a push to the playoffs, though, with, with, with mm -hmm. how everything's opened up. But, yeah, like you said, I think the division's sort of like out of reach because, like you said, all those games they got to make up. All right, to the West we go. We go West, we go West. Uh, I mean, the Dodgers, I mean, they're, I know they've lost a couple in a row, but, you know, they're, they're well ahead <laughs> in, in, in theory and numbers-wise. So, you know, they got a 100% chance to make the playoffs, so I'm not worried about the Dodgers. I'm worried about the team that's below them, the San Diego Padres. They're still, they're still, you know, right there for that playoff spot. They've won seven in the last ten. Do you think the Padres can sneak in there? Not really. Sneak, I think they not I, 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 I think 
I think they can, as I mentioned before, these last few weeks, uh, Fernando Tatis, uh, he should be your NL MVP uh, top Don't candidate. Don't probably say his name, uh, Sid. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I've been over there, so I'm not, no, no, so I'm, I'm not going to fall for that trap again. <laughs> so Fernando Tatis is your NL MVP candidate next to Mookie Betts for the Los Angeles Dodgers. The one thing that I'm worried about in that division is Colorado. I know they were leading uh, the wild card. Uh, a couple of days ago, but they they always struggle when they go to L.A. to play the Dodgers, and that's the case what happened again. Mm-hmm. I know they played the Padres on Monday. Uh, it seems like they can't get it together for some reason. And they have all that talent offensively, but they just they just don't have the starting pitching. Yeah, I think that was, you know, that's been, like you said, that's been kind of the problem for them the last few, last few years for you know, Colorado. I mean, Colorado – how they've fallen, right? I mean, they went from leading the division till now they're like, they're all the way down. They're, they're, they're like, like two games out of the last playoff spot. So that's going to be, yeah, that's going to be a problem because I think, I believe, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but I think they still have a couple of series left against the Dodgers and the, I think, yeah, they played the, the, the Dodgers uh, series starts tonight, starting tonight. So you got, you know, we know the Dodgers are on a mission, so, <laughs> so uh, that's going to be a, a problem for for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're if you're the Padre, I mean, you know, if you're the Rockies, I think you definitely need to kind of like, you know, get get on get on the the train here if you want to, you know, compete for a playoff spot. Yeah, I just don't know if they'll have enough games to make up and to do it, but we'll see what happens because the regular season will be over before you know it since now we're in September. All right, let me get let me get Colorado's – they actually play the Padres tonight, and I think they've got a couple mm-hmm. more series against the Dodgers, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, so if you're Colorado, if you want a chance to sort of get back into the – you know, get back into the playoff chase, I mean, you're going to have to, you know – buckle down, batten down the hatches, because, like you said, the regular season will be over before you know it. Yep. All right. Anything else baseball-wise that got you, you know, got you, got your your, your radar going? Uh, No, I'm good. Let's just see if the White Sox and Cubs locally can keep it going, and it, and it should be fun. Yeah, these last three yeah. weeks. I mean, look, I think the schedule. I think the the you know, I don't know about you, Sid, but I think the schedule should always be like this. I like the sixty game sort of aspect of it. Sort of every series being a must win, and that you can't afford to have a slow start. I don't know how you. That's just my feeling. What do you think about the this the scheduling? Uh, uh several should have shows a little bit more games. One hundred forty four, to be honest with you, like they did in ninety five, only because of the. 94 strike yeah. but with that being said we we told you guys before the season started every game counts because of a short condensed season and, and it was a mostly a division <clears throat> excuse me regional schedule so you find out which teams can separate themselves and which teams are not as good of course they cannot play each other outside of the division which stinks until the playoffs but i think that gives the playoffs this year a little bit more uh heightened awareness because you really have to measure yourself against um, another team outside of the division. I think that's what's going to make the MLB playoffs a little bit more interesting this year than in years past because of the condensed schedule uh, with you playing within your division. So it's going to be interesting come playoff time because you have to match up yourself against assuming a a healthy Yankees team or Oakland team, which I'm telling people right now to watch out for. Maybe this is the year for them to go to the World Series. We'll see. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, like I said, it'll be yeah. definitely interesting these next few weeks. So, Sid, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to take a little, you know, to stretch, as Hawk would say. Um, yes. All right, so we'll talk NFL. We're going to have talk, you know, NFL. You know, the Bears name their starting quarterback. We'll have our other little previews, of you know, of each of the divisions. The Cardinals lock up DeAndre Hopkins. And, you know, a FedEx Cup champion has been crowded in golf. And he got the U.S. Open. And it looks just so much to do still. So, and also college football started. You know, I'll ask Sid if he checked out, check out some of the games this weekend. So, more Second City Sports Zoom style. Zoom style. All right. We'll be right back. All right, folks. Welcome back to Second City Sports Zoom style. Zoom style. <laughs> All right, I'm once again, I'm Lakina McGee. You can follow me at Kina McGee on Twitter and at Kina underscore underscore McGee on the Instagram. 
You can follow yours truly, Sid the Kid, on Twitter and Instagram at SidKid80. Once again, at SidKid80. That's S-I-D-K-I-D-8-0. That's S-I-D-K-I-D-8-0. You can listen to this program along with our other hot programming from We Are Regal Radio by going to War on Anchor. It kicks you over to Spotify, SoundCloud, and everywhere else where you wherever else you can download your podcast. Just search for War on Anchor. Also, we on iHeartRadio. Please download that iHeartRadio app. Search for War on Anchor. And voila, we're there. Search for all of our beautiful programming where we are Regal Radio, including Second City Sports. Also, and we're also on YouTube, too. So where can I find, find us on YouTube, Sid? War Media. That's W-A-R-R Media. You have access to all the videos from all the shows that we've done since we started doing this sort of remote Zoom style. Also, the other shows as well. The That's Davis show, which, and also the show with Joshua Hicks, among others. So you can see our lovely faces if you want. So subscribe and tell your friends. Yes, please do so and get the likes up. Please get them up, get them up, get them up. <laughs> and the descriptions too, as well. Um, so I can't believe it, but we're, we're recording this on a Tuesday because, you know, of course, yesterday was a holday, Labor Day. But we get NFL football starting on Thursday. I can't believe it. I can't believe after everything that's been happening, everything that's been going on, some of us didn't think that this would happen because we wouldn't get this far, but we made it. There's definitely going to be some changes this year with everything, with no no one on the sidelines except for the players and the coaches. We got media people probably going to be like somewhere like all around the uh, the, the stadiums and arenas, wherever they're. Yeah. Some some stadiums will have people, some will have fans, but some will not. So, before we get to our divisional previews, Sid, what do you think with this whole like this new world we're going to be working in for with NFL for the, this the, well, this season anyway? Uh, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I did say that the NFL season will start on time, and that's exactly what's happening. Of course, they had to cancel the preseason to make sure the players were following uh, protocol and safety guidelines. And so far, they've been doing that with few uh, positive tests reported. I know we had that, the story a couple weeks ago about the, the false positive test. Thank goodness they were just false positives, but hopefully that situation doesn't come up again. But with that being said, I'm still excited for football. I believe we're going to get through this season. Uh, I'm not going to say it's not going to be any minor bumps and bruises on the, uh, along the way, but I don't think it's going to be anything too major where they cannot finish this season. I guarantee you this, unless something real, real big happens, the NFL will find a way to finish this season. They're not going to cancel it. You know as well as I do, Lakina, that the NFL is a big sport, the number one sport in the United States. And, and, and heaven forbid, and I do mean heaven forbid, something happens if you have to post, uh, uh, put a pause on the season, they will, uh, the NFL will find a way to finish it, whether it's in March, April, May, because they know that we love football. They're going to find a way to finish the season. The appetite's there, and like you said, Sid, I think mm-hmm. they will try. They will you know, be able to finish the series, the, the season. You know, look at that; it's going to look different. Mm-hmm. There's not going to be, you know, you don't. You we'll see, you know, put reporters on the sidelines. You'll probably see folks um, around, you know, maybe around like the first, you know, first platform of the uh, at the stadiums and arenas. So. Mm-hmm. It's, Look, the look and the feel of it's going to be different. You know, like you said, there's going to be some some teams will have will be able to have fans, but some will not. Mm-hmm. We'll see if you know that'll have an advantage. You know, if that even makes a difference. But I'm looking forward to it. I think. Look, I've got a couple of fantasy teams going on, and I I think some people forgot that NFL is coming up because of the other big yeah. things going on. But I'm excited. I mean, look, I I can't wait to see what what happens once we get more and more in depth into this. I mean, how's Tom Brady going to do in Tampa? Who's the, who's the favorite? Does, does Cam make the Patriots still a favorite in the in the AFC East? I mean, can the, the Chiefs, you know, can the Chiefs, you know, some people say the Chiefs can be even better than they were last year. And, of course, you know, we'll start with our Bears. You know, the Bears have – Matt Nagy has named – they have named you know, Mitch, Mitchell Trubisky their starting quarterback. So what do you think about that decision? Uh, like I said, we'll break down the Bears a little bit more in depth on our next podcast uh, coming up this weekend. But as I said before on this, on this, um, in previous weeks on on this show, I'm not surprised that Trubisky was named the starter. 
Because here's the thing. We talked about this on our last podcast last week with Maya Kai from Sean and Maya in the morning. Trubisky is there because the Bears organization wants to squeeze out every ounce of what they have left of Mitchell Trubisky. They really want to start Nick Foles, but they don't want to look bad with egg on their face, in particular GM Ryan Peso. We're going to give Trubisky a chance. This is his last dance, quote, unquote. So he's on his last rope. Uh, can he hang on and do what he needs to do? Or will Nick Foles come in and save the season? Uh, it is, that's going to be the number one storyline going in for the Bears this year. I couldn't agree with you more, Sid. I mean, there's, you know, there's a reason why that Trubisky got to start and not Foles because for the reason you said, I mean, Ryan Pace does not want to look bad. And everyone says, well, he's been playing really well, but the others have said he hasn't. We haven't had any preseason games to sort of make any assumptions. Mm-hmm. So we're going by what, you know, people have said, people we know and trust who are there mm-hmm. that they have, they, they've said. So, you know, it's all sort of like, all this is sort of like a toss up at this point. You look at Detroit. I mean, Detroit's actually looking pretty good. I don't know. Look, they probably won't, won't you know, make a, a push for the playoffs. That those those extra that extra wild card spot that the NFL has this year. But you know, okay. they could definitely. They're they're not like an easy one on the schedule, if you will. So, this is gonna be very interesting. The running game is still a little bit questionable. We'll see how David Montgomery is. The defense, look, the defense is good enough so that they'll be able to keep all keep them in all the games, but. Then they mm-hmm. may, have to, may have to win a couple, but you can't depend on them. You need to, your offense to do right. And if Trubisky stinks those first couple of weeks, I know they're supposed to be like easier opponents, if you will, but mm-hmm. it it's not going to look good for Trubisky. And they may, and Mackie may give him the hook right away. Yeah, they it may have to come down to that because, it, as you mentioned, uh, both Matt Nagy, the head coach, and Jim Ryan Pace, their jobs are on the line. So if they don't win, uh, they don't do anything to uh, increase their chances for the Monsters of the Midway to win games. Uh, both of those heads are going to be chopped off and they'll be sent back in the other way. So they're going to do it, it, any and everything within their power to help the Bears win ball games. All right. You know, doing a, we'll just do like a – since we haven't had a chance to go like really in-depth on all divisions, we'll just do like a quick synopsis of each division. How mm-hmm. about that? Probably and I'll give my uh, – we'll give our predictions as we go. All right, cool. So, and this is being recorded, so you're going to hold us to it. Yes, we, yes, you will. Yes, we will. And we apologize yeah. in advance. Uh, we'll start in the AFC East. Now, with Cam Newton now with the Patriots, Buffalo, they got Stephon Diggs from the trade to Minnesota. Miami showed a little bit of strides last year. Also, the Jets, too. They were 7-9, and nine, which is, I think, I think will shock some Jets fans. Where do you see the a- AFC East? <clears throat> I will give my prediction. I have Buffalo winning that division. Of course, uh, they got into the playoffs last year, uh, thanks to quarterback Josh Allen, and, but uh, in particular their their defense. Uh, they have one of the best secondaries in the league. They should have won at Houston last year during Wild Card Weekend. Uh, they gave their game away. You know, Bill O'Brien, which we'll talk about later, almost gave their game away for Houston. So, but with that being said, you have Stephon Diggs, as you mentioned, number one wide receiver that which they have lacked forever. Um, Denver, not Denver, New England, they have Ken Noon, as you mentioned, but they have players, especially on the defensive side of the ball, that will not be playing this year due, uh, due to opt out to COVID, in particular Dante Hightower, who's a new father now. Congratulations to him on that. But I think New England's still going to be competitive. Miami, I kind of like that team. I've been trying to prop them up all offseason. Will they make it to the playoffs? I don't know. I know Ryan Fitzpatrick, no shock. He's the starting quarterback for now. I know to attack of Valoa, I think I said that name correctly, is their future. He's the backup. Of course, the Jets, they don't have a number one wide receiver. Their defense is still good, but they still need work. And you have to find out this year also if Sam Darnold is your uh, franchise quarterback moving forward. Uh, with all that being said, I have Buffalo as Buffalo as my AFC East division winner. I mean, look, we'll look. We'll see if New England was Tom Brady and Bill Belichick, or more, you know, either way. So, mm-hmm. but I have, but like you said, I have Buffalo winning that division. They just lost the Tre'Davious White for a few more years. Very deserving as you know, Pro Bowler. I, I, I you know, and also I, th- I think that I think they're still smarting from that from that loss to the Texans last year, which they should have won that game. 
I picked them to win that mm-hmm. game, and I feel really stupid now. So <laughs> I, I think, look, Josh Allen has has made you know definitely made progress. Had you know had a few little hiccups, but look, he's young. He's getting better. I look, I I think that 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 the team is there. I think the the, the aspect of it is there too. So. I guess, like like I said, having Diggs there, they definitely beefs up that wide receiving core, and also Cole Beasley's there too. Don't forget about him and their defense. Yeah, I talked about you know Travis White. I've, I've talked you know Ed Oliver, who they just drafted from Houston. You know, I love him. Tremaine Edmonds is still there, and Micah Hyde. So I think they definitely mm-hmm. have the they definitely have the, the team to go far in the playoffs in the, if they get there. So I got them winning the East. As for New England, there's too many question marks. Like you said, a lot of guys have opted out. Yeah, Cam Newton, we'll see how he fares in that offense. But just don't, they'll be right there. They'll be competitive because all Bill Bowl to tick teams are, are competitive. Yeah. I just don't see them making a push for the playoffs. I just don't. The Jets, not having Jamal Adams there, that's going to be a big, big issue there for them. We'll see how Sam Darnold is. I mean, I'm kind of indif- ambivalent about the Jets, so I don't know what to think. So I'm, I'm kind of like leery of them. Miami, I'll, we'll see if Miami can make a push. I mean, they, they definitely made their, their inroads as well. Brian Flores, you know, we had Spiro Diaz on a couple of months ago. He was raving about the job he did last year. So I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm dying to see how that team looks. So, but I have Buffalo win that division. All right, so let's go. Next up, let's go to the AFC, the ever popular and ever competitive AFC North. Now, Baltimore, Baltimore has, well, I'm sure they're they're kicking themselves for that <laughs> for that loss against the Titans in the divisional <laughs> round. You know, I'm sure look, I'm sure still having nightmares about Derrick Henry running all over them. So they're on mm-hmm. a mission. I think Baltimore went and look, look at their schedule. They stayed like basically within the Eastern time zone or the central time zone. They'll go, they'll go, they don't have to go West. You look at their schedule. So I think Houston is probably like the furthest West, the further West, furthest West that they go to, <laughs> they have to go. So mm-hmm. I think that definitely will help their advantage. We'll see how Lamar Jackson is. I think, you know, you got Mark Ingram, we got Marquise Brown. I mean, look, this is, Look, this is a team that that I feel that they kind of left it out there. And so I really think that they can definitely – they remember that. Look, John Harbaugh, this is, this is his first rodeo. So, you know, the defense has been really good. They definitely have – they definitely beat up that defense game. Calais Campbell, I think that's a – that mm-hmm. seven was a big issue for them last year, especially with, you know, Derrick Henry basically running all over them in that divisional round. So I think Baltimore will win the division. Not as easy. They won't win 14. I think they'll still win like 12 games, but I think they'll win the division. Pittsburgh, I know that Big Ben, everyone says that Big, ben, Big Ben's feeling better and looks good, but he's getting up there in age. Now, that, that, that injury still kind of bothers me a little bit, but they definitely, they, they definitely beats up their defense. And I think they'll be, look, we got Juju Smith-Schuster, you know, James Conner, of course, in the backfield. You know, Cam Hayward, they were able to lock him up. So... I think they'll definitely be one of the playoff spots. I'll say that the both the Ohio teams. I mean, they're, you know, they're, you know, they're 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 young. They still got you know either first year coaches or second year, second year coaches. So I'm not really worried about Cleveland or Cincy. I don't. I mean, I know that they they had you know I think I know Cincy got a lot of good young young talent that they drafted, but I just don't see them making any big stop. I know Joe, we'll see how Joe Burrow does. I mean, he's now, he looked very NFL ready, of course, at LSU, but it's a whole different mm-hmm. era now. So we'll see what happens with him. And same thing with Cleveland, you know, they got, they got a new head coach. I, I just don't, I just don't see it with Cleveland. I think Cleveland's going to be Cleveland. So what do you think about the North? <laughs> you just took the words right out of my mouth, Lakina. I have Baltimore winning the division as well. They'll probably win 11, 12 games, maybe 13. That's probably pushing it a little bit, but i say about 11 to 12. Now, I actually have Pittsburgh as one of my wild card teams, and I think Big Ben, excuse me, will stay healthy. Yes, he's getting up there in age, but if he stays healthy, Pittsburgh has, has a shot. The question is, will James kind of be healthy enough to run the football? They have a young defense on the other side, which got better last year, especially after they trade for Mika Fitzpatrick from Miami. So, uh, was, that's when uh, Pittsburgh took off as a team, not just a defense, but as a team as well. They almost got into the playoffs last year with Duck Hodges and, 
Mason <laughs> Rudolph still himself. But, but with that being said, if Ben Roethlisberger stays healthy, Pittsburgh will uh, be able to make a playoff spot. I have them as one of my three wild card teams coming out of the AFC. And then with the other two teams, I'm not going to waste my time with them. Not the Ohio teams. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> right. I'm not, move, move on, move on, move on. Okay, AFC South. I'll let, I'll, I'll let you start with first, the AFC South. <laughs> AFC South, my division winner for the AFC South is, if you can hear that, yep. the Indianapolis Colts. Here's why. Philip Rivers, I know he's there for one year, but you have one of the best young, one of the best head coaches in the league, and Frank Wright, one of the best offensive minds in the league. You have a young running back named Marlon Mack. And him the bid that Rivers goes down. You have Jacoby Brissett, uh, who's a capable backup. Remember, Indianapolis was five and two in the middle of the year last year before mm -hmm. he got hurt at Pittsburgh, and then of course things snowballed down here from there. And they're on their way to the playoffs until he got hurt. So let's not forget about that. Mm -hmm. Jacksonville, they train everybody. I know Gardner Minshew is their um, quarterback in the second year playoff in Washington State, but. They're trading everybody. I'm not going. I'm not going to sit here and say they are tanking for Trevor Lawrence, but uh, it is a, uh, Frank Marone has a new culture down there. I know Tom Coughlin's out of there now. Leonard Fournette, the running back, is now in in Tampa. So Jacksonville's going through a, a, a culture change there. The Houston Texans. Congrats to Deshaun Watson, their franchise quarterback. They locked him up for a few more years. But I don't trust their head coach, Bill O'Brien. I have them out of the playoffs. I do. You have no running game. I know they have David Johnson. He used to be with Arizona. But he's been injuring Paul the last couple of years. If he stays healthy, maybe he gives them a shot. But I just don't trust that team. I really don't trust the head coach. And on the other side, you have J.J. Watt. He's one of the best defensive players in the league. But he's been uh, uh, not healthy the last couple of years as well. So I have Houston out. The wild card for me is Tennessee. I know they picked up Jadavian Clowney the other day. How much can he give the Titans defensively? I don't know. Actually, they really did well, obviously, without him last year because Clowney was with Seattle. But I don't know how much he gives the, the Titans, to be honest with you. If he gives them something, great. But if he doesn't, you should not be surprised. <sighs> well, look, I, I, I got the Colts win this division. They'll yeah. be the only playoff team for me coming out of that division. Yeah, and I can see that too. I, I think, like you said, I think Phil Rivers, I don't guess he's getting up there in age, but he wants a chance to try to win, and I think that, that he can do that there in Indianapolis. Like you said, Brissett's there, so in case, you know, God forbid, he gets hurt, Phil you know, Rivers gets hurt. But you got, Marlon, you got Marlon Mack, you got Jonathan Taylor, who they just drafted from Wisconsin. They got, you got T.Y. Hilton, also Michael Pittman Jr. I mean – you know, DeForest Buckner, you know, on the defensive side, also Darius Leonard. Let's not forget Darius Leonard, too, who was hurt in and out of the lineup last year. Just, I really like him. Yeah, he just read his mind, so – read my mind. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, he was hurt last year. And remember the guy, Xavier Rhodes, too, from Minnesota. Yeah. So I think – look, I, I got also got the Colts winning that division. That's a very winnable division. And, look, Frank Reck, I think, doesn't get his due coaching-wise. He's one of the best coaches – you know, in the league, sort of like rising stars. This is a guy that's mm -hmm. been around the league for a long, long time, of course, was known for that big – he led that big comeback against the then Houston Oilers with Buffalo, you know, years and years ago. So this is a man that's been in the round a long time. So, yeah, Tennessee, I think they take a step back. I mean, I just – you know, they, I, don't, I know Ryan Tannehill's there, <laughs> but, but you also wonder, too, you know, does how much she sort of, you know – Legs has as Derrick Henry have. I mean, he's not he's not old, but yet running back, running running mm -hmm. back, running back years, he's old. So you, you got to think that's going to be a little bit of an issue there. Their defense, I know Cloudy gives us sort of that, that little bit of that boost, but they really weren't they weren't bad, but they weren't good either. So I don't know if Clowney sort of you know gives them that sort of oomph, but we'll see. Houston, I know, I know Deshaun Watts just signed that big contract, and but also, you know, JJ Watts older. Uh, they they trade DeAndre Hopkins to Arizona. You know, David Johnson, Duke Johnson, no relation, but I just, I mean, also the defense is getting older too. I mean, I, I just don't see it happening. I know Mer Merciless is still there too, but I just don't see it for Houston. Um, Jacksonville, like you said, they've traded everybody. I know Minshew there, Minshew mania, but I just, I, again, I just don't see. I'm not going to waste my time with them. So I, I also have, 
<laughs> right. I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, right, Sid? I mean, like, listen, you said that about the Ohio teams. Uh, I don't, I see the Colts being the only representative in that division. All right, let's go to the AFC West. You got the defending Super Bowl champions, Kansas City Chiefs. Um, they basically brought everybody back for the most part. <clears throat> um, so where do you, I'll let you go first in that, in the West division. I'll get my pick out of the way for the AFC West. I have the Kansas City Chiefs winning that division. They may take a step back or two, but they're still pretty good. They uh, remain healthy. Uh, the Los Angeles Chargers, they'll be my second wild card team coming out of that division. I don't know people are questioning, will Tyrod Taylor stay healthy? Will he, will he perform throughout the season? If he can, uh, they have a great chance. They still have a, a very good defense. My guy, Melvin Ingram. I know Derwin James is out for the year once uh -huh. again. But with that being said, I think that um, the Chargers can still be pretty good. You have Austin Eckler, who's the pre the feature back now. He was a year ago, but we didn't know until, you know, because of Melvin Gordon's contract situation. Now, speaking of Melvin Gordon, he's with the Broncos now, joining Phil, Philip Lindsay in the backfield. They have Drew Locke as their quarterback. I think Denver will take a, a slight step uh, with second-year head coach Vic Vangio, but I don't know if it's going to be enough to get them a, a playoff spot only because the division that they're in and the type of uh, quarterback that they have. Drew Locke did show some signs last year, but I need to see more from him. Uh, wrapping up that division, the Las Vegas Raiders, uh, they probably will improve, but I don't know if they have enough to sneak in as a wild card. And I think John Gruden may have to face reality of, getting rid of Derek Carr if Derek Carr doesn't take that next step because we all saw him as an MVP in 2016 before he got hurt before uh, they played their playoff game and lost to Houston. But it's been a struggle for Carr for the last three years. Uh, and he actually did a little bit better last year, but not to where we thought that he was during his MVP season. Now, if Derek Carr doesn't turn it around, John Groom will, will have no choice but to get rid of him. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. They got a nice, bunch of nice young players, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And they got some um, playmakers on the offensive side of the ball, in particular Josh Jacobs. We saw what he did against the Bears last year in London, running all over that defense. So you have a playmaker there. Uh, they still have a bunch of young talent, but I just don't trust them enough to make a push for a wild card spot. I just don't. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll keep it kind of short. I mean, the, the Chiefs, as long as everyone stays healthy, I think they'll think they should win that division. Not easily, but I think they should be able to win it. It's very hard to repeat. I know people are saying that now that everyone, most of everybody's going to be back, you know, it's going to be the start of a dynasty. But the Patriots will tell you that it's it's actually pretty tough. So we'll see what they do. Um, Denver, look, I I think they could be right there for those three wild card spots. You know, Drew Locke looked really good last year in those last, you know, few games. You know, I know like a couple of no-name guys, but, you know, listen, you got Melvin Gordon there now. We'll see what they do. The defense is young. You still got Von Miller. We'll see how much he has left mm -hmm. in the tank. But I think I think Denver can, has an outside shot of at least making it competitive for those last wild card spots. Same with Oakland. If Derek Carr doesn't, you know, show you the Derek Carr, Derek Carr that we saw from a few years ago, you can kind of just forget it. You may have to say bye bye to him. As for the Chargers, you know, look, not having Derwin James is going to be, you know, going to be hard. But look, Tyra Taylor is a very, you know, capable veteran. You still got Austin Eckler. You still got, you still got, you know, Justin Jackson. You got Keenan Allen. So. I'm not worried. I mean, you still got Joey Bosa and mm -hmm. Melvin Ingram too. So I think they can definitely make a make a make a challenge for that. I think they can make a challenge for that wild card spots, one of those wild card spots. So we may see two teams coming out of that AFC West. All right, let's go east now. Uh, like I said, I have. Right. Go ahead. Oh, uh, just just real quick, my third wild card team. Coming out of the AFC is the New England Patriots. If Cam Newton can stay healthy, New England has a shot. If he doesn't, you can say bye bye to him. My three wild card teams out of the AFC is Pittsburgh, New England, and the Los Angeles Chargers. Hmm. I do, I do too. That those are my three too. Stop reading my mind, Sid. Uh, <laughs> let's go to the NFC. No, it's opposite. <laughs> oh yeah, true. 
we may have the order wrong, but yeah, we got the same <laughs> one. <laughs> but uh, let's go to the NFC, which probably the most, I would say probably the most wide open division is probably the a- a- NFC East. Where do you see that division? I only have one team coming out of that division. That's your division winning champions, the Dallas Cowboys. Of course, I know Dak Prescott is not locked up long term yet, but I believe they will get that done, especially after learning about Deshaun Watson's contract from the Houston Texans. Uh, Mike McCarthy is the championship head coach. Uh, the the uh, Jerry Jones actually got the head coach right for once. Uh, they say goodbye to Jason Gary after last season. Uh, you, you still have Ezekiel Elliott running the ball. Uh, you have Avari Cooper, who they gave five five years, $100 million to during the offseason. So he's ready to go. Uh, that defense is still pretty good. So uh, the Cowboys, this probably be, be has, this will probably be their best team since Dak and Zeke uh, joined the team as rookies back in 2016. So I have them winning that division. Philadelphia, too many injuries right now. Can Carson Wentz stay healthy? I'm not sure. Washington's going through their um, – transitional phase both on and off the field the new york giants maybe they could be a surprise but i got to see more for them especially from first year head coach joe judge from new england yeah i feel the same way about this division i think this is dallas's division to lose i mean i look dad prescott's playing for big money so especially i'm sure we saw how much deshaun watson got so i'm sure he's going to be you know wearing to go um Zeke elliott i mean you got to kind of give him the ball more and feed him Feed the Zeke, as we've been saying. They got CeeDee Lamb from Oklahoma. You know, you got Demarcus Lawrence is still there. And Randy Gregory, we'll see. You know, he got clear for, you know, clear mm-hmm. for the, to come back. But it'll be a while before he can actually play. So we'll see how he does there. Um, you got Ever- Everson Griffin they were able to get from Minnesota. So I think that definitely t- helps their defense. So I'm, I, I think Dallas wins the division. And I think they're the only two that are going to go to the playoffs from the division. Philly, they're getting older, too many injuries. I, I just don't see it happening for them. Both, you know, Washington's going through their transition with both their coaching and with their name, like you said. So I think that's going to be a thing there. And the Giants, I mean, we'll see if Daniel Jones can make inroads. We'll see if Saquon Barkley can make inroads. They might be able to push to get that playoff, one of those three playoff spots, but I don't think they're ready yet. Maybe next year, but I have Philly. I have Philly. I mean, yeah, no, I have Dallas coming out of that division. All right, we're in the probably one of the most competitive divisions, probably one of the most intriguing divisions, the NFC South. All right, this is probably, and you know, I'll start this off because I'm. I think, think that this is probably going to be like one of those divisions where it's going to literally going to be like a knockdown, drag out fight. Of course, you got the you, know, you got you know Tampa Bay. Of course, you know Tom Brady's back. He was able to get Gronk to come back, come back. Also, now Leonard Fournette's there now. He he was able to stay in Florida, so that's you know that's going to be very interesting to sort of shore up that bat field. They got Ronald Jones. They got Shady McCoy. You got Adama Sue over there on the in the defense. You got also Levante David. You know Shaquille Barrett and Antoine Winfield Jr. They just you know drafted from Minnesota University of Minnesota, so. I'm going to say this, and Gordon knows, feel free to jump at me if I'm wrong, but I have the Bucks winning that division. They were very close to getting the division last year, let a couple of games slip away those last, you know, those last few weeks of the season. They would have been right there. Okay, as for the Saints, I think the Saints will get in as a wild card. It looks like the Alva Kamara situation sort of has sort of kind of tapered off a bit there. It looks like they're getting ready to kind of announce a big decision for them, how they're going to get the money, who knows. Um, but I guess they got to keep them happy. They also got Michael Thomas, probably the best wide receiver in the league. Their defense has been, you know, very good too. You got Cam, Cam Jordan, Marcus Davenport, Malcolm Jenkins. They were, you know, that they got him. Um, also Marshawn Lattimore. So I think they, I think the Bucks just will, will just inch out of the Saints to win that division. And Atlanta, we'll see. I mean, I know they were very close, but. I just don't see it for them. I know they got Todd Gurley back. We'll see because I'm sure they're going to have to feed him a lot. I think they'll just miss game that wild card spot. And also Carolina, I think they're in tra- transition with a new coaching staff and such. So not maybe not next, maybe not this year for them. Our first disagreement of 
of the day, I have the New Orleans Saints winning the division, but not by much. I think this is Drew Brees' last run uh, as an NFL quarterback. And with the Saints, this this is probably their last great shot of winning the Super Bowl. I I believe that truly, so I, I'll give a slight edge to the Saints only because of their talent and their experience. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers, there will be my first of three NFC wildcard teams. I think it's going to get uh, the chemistry intact and head coach Bruce Aarons, like you mentioned, he has new toys to play with now. Of course, Leonard was picked up last week from Jacksonville, so he's going to give them an option to run the football. So they're not going to put put too much pressure on Brady, especially not early when you want to establish a re- preseason game. So I think Tampa, they're going to struggle early, but come, come a late October going into November, just like the New England Patriots always do, they're going to find a way to be consistent and start winning ball games. As far as Atlanta's concerned, I know head coach Dan Quinn is on his last legs. Uh, they had a, a disappointing year last year. They had injuries all over the place, especially in the secondary, but they got together to pull together to finish at seven and nine, I believe. So mm-hmm. it saved Dan Quinn's job for now. But if they don't make it to the playoffs, uh, you can say goodbye to him. And like you said, Teddy Bridgewater, the new quarterback for Carolina, uh, I think he's going to be good for them, but they're in transition as well. So my division winner from the NC South is the New Orleans Saints. My wild card team is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers coming out of that division. Well, we had the teams, right? Just, just, the, just the, uh, just the order. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, all right. Another very intriguing division, in my opinion, the right. NFC West. So, what do you think about the West, Mr. Brown? Uh, my division winner for that division will be the Seattle Seahawks. Last year, they were a heartbeat away from reaching the NFC title game against the San Francisco 49ers. You still have Russell Wilson, a top-five quarterback, a top-five MVP candidate there. Uh, they picked up Jamal Adams via trade from the New York Jets. Uh, they actually have a running game now. I don't know if Marshawn Lynch is back or not, but if he doesn't, you still have had Chris Carson there. Uh, you have D.K. Metcalf going into his second year, a, a stud wide receiver, so – uh, Russell Wilson actually has weapons for the first time since his first couple of years in, in the league. And their defense is still good enough. It's not where it was uh, during their heyday, but it's still good enough to give teams problems. So my division winner there is the Seattle Seahawks. Now my wild card team coming out of that division, I've been saying this all off season, and they have an easy schedule, the Arizona Cardinals. Mm-hmm. Kyle Murray's going to make a big jump from year one to year two. DeAndre Hopkins, as you mentioned, I believe, Lakina. Uh, uh, early in this podcast, a, uh, Arizona uh, signed him to a two-year extension, so he's going to be an Arizona Cardinal for five years, and he's going to get paid $18.8 million a year. So Kyle Murray has a number one target in DeAndre Hopkins, and you still have Larry Vizgerald, Vis- whose uh, who's age is just getting better with time, so you, you don't have to depend on him anymore, but he's still there to give guidance to Murray and uh, DeAndre Hopkins. So I uh, like Simmons, their rookie they picked up in the NFL draft as I've been raving all, all off season. I know they had a couple of players checked out uh, for this year because of COVID, but I think they should still be good enough to win. I think for them, 97, 10, and 6 will be good enough for them to qualify for the playoffs. So I'm going with Arizona as a wild card team. San Francisco, you guys are going to be in for a big surprise. I'm comparing them to the 2018 Chicago Bears. You rode that defense to the Super Bowl. Well, it's time for Jimmy G to make that big play. He failed to Emmanuel Sanders, who's now with the Saints. Uh, his, uh, San Francisco, even though they still have a good defense, let's be honest here, they didn't have to deal with many injuries last year. So I think injuries could be a question this year. If they have started to have a lot of them, uh, it's going to be trouble. Foster just got a contract extension. Congratulations to him. But I, I, don't, I don't know if San Francisco is going to win 13 games again. If they make it to the playoffs, they'll barely make it their 10 or 11 wins. So, uh, But me personally, I had them out of the playoffs. The Rams, uh, they have some weapons on offense, but who's going to run the ball? And you're really going to find out who Jared Goff really is, especially now with Ty Gurley in Atlanta. They still have a great defense with Aaron Donald, but outside of that, who's going to run the ball for the Rams? And like I said before, Jared Goff, we're really going to find out what type of quarterback he is because you don't have a stud running back. You basically, yeah, you sold all the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I mean, look, I think Seattle will. Don't do- stop. 
Yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> you know, right, right? I mean, listen, look, like it's good to agree sometimes. Um, I think Seattle will do just enough to win that division. Oh, don't forget, too, they got Greg Olson there now. So I think that helps. That gives Russell Wilson another target for him to, yeah. throw, for him to throw to. You mentioned Metcalf and also Tyler Lockett. And, you know, and I think that they'll do just enough that that O line, though, still worries me. I wince every time, you know, Russell Wilson gets hit. I really do. But I think they'll do yeah. just enough. Enough there. I mean, look, Jamal Adams. I think they'll, that that gives a sort of a sort of that boost. They're not legion of boom, but I think they'll do just enough to win the division. I think they'll edge out. I have Arizona too coming out of the one of the wild cards. They were very close in a couple of games last year, and I think that the system sort of fits Kyler Mur Kyler Murray's you know sort of your know, strengths. Uh, you got you got DeAndre Hopkins, like you said. And also, you got Max Williams, too. Don't forget about him. Also, Larry Fitzgerald and Christian Kirk. So, I think that helps. And their offense is act, off of the line is actually pretty good over in Arizona. Um, the defense is solid as, as well. I mean, you know, we'll see how much Patrick Peterson has left in the tank. But Chandler Jones, you know, is one of those guys that I think a lot of people don't know too much about or have never, you know, bothered to, to hear about. Also, but Buddha Baker is another one. They just drafted him. And like you said, so they got, they, yeah, a couple guys have, have, have you know, opt out because of your know, COVID concerns is understandable, but mm-hmm. but at the same time though, I mean, this, that, there's a lot of depth on that team, so I think they'll and like you said, their their schedule. If you look at their schedule, it's actually have one. Of the, they actually have one of the easiest schedules in the league, so I think they can. They, yeah. they, they'll, they'll be able to take advantage of that. So I think look look for them to win ten or eleven and just finish just outside the division. But they will they will get one of the wild cards. San Francisco, I think they can definitely compete. I don't know if this is going to be like a, one of those instances where like a couple of years ago with the Bears, they just, you know, go fall off. I mean, you know, I'm sure, listen, Jimmy, Jimmy G, I'm sure is, is he's still smart. <laughs> he's still smarting, but you still got Nick Bosa. You still got Jimmy Ward. You got guys like, you know, Richard Sherman is still, you know, we'll see how much he has left in the tank, but I think he's still good. I think also George Kittle. I mean, he's one of the best tight ends of the league. So I'm not too worried and Debo Samuel. So I'm not too worried about them. I think they'll do just enough to get that second wild card. I really think that they'll – actually, that's my third wild card, so I'm all out of wild cards. So they'll do just enough. Los Angeles, I mean, they've had to get rid of a lot of salary, so they're not – I mean, we'll see how we'll see how good Jared Goff is, but the whole team, though, unless you can find somebody to run the ball, I just don't see them doing that. So I wouldn't be surprised if somehow three of these four teams make it because there's so much depth in that division, but we'll see. It's very possible. But like I said, for me, I got two. We'll see. Yeah, like I said, we'll, we'll see. I mean, that division is going to be very competitive. Like you said, Arizona's got a tough schedule. They might end up winning that division. Who knows? But we'll see. All right, last but not least, so let's go up north. Let's go up north to the NFC North. You go first. <laughs> My division winner, even though I do not like this team, <laughs> uh, but I think they have enough talent just to get by. They're not going to have as great as the Minnesota Vikings. I know they lost five players off of their defense because of their age, uh, in, in particular, Everson Griffin. But I think Kirk Cousins, uh, he, he did show a step last year by getting the, uh, the team into the playoffs. Even though they should have won a division last year, they got in that wild card, defeated the Saints on the road before getting their heads smashed in that San Francisco in the divisional round. But with that being said, I think they have the best roster within the division. Uh, they still have Dal- Dalvin Cook. Hopefully he stays healthy for another year. I know he had a contract. We'll see how that plays out. But with that, uh, let's see if Adam Thielen can stay healthy this year. He's their number one target. I know Stephon Diggs is gone now. I know they drafted a wide receiver with their first-round pick. We'll see how that works out. But I have Minnesota winning that division. The Detroit Lions, I know many people are picking them to be a surprise. Until I see it, I'm not going to believe it. I know they had a 500 record last year before Matthew Stafford got hurt. Uh, for me, let's see if their defense can be consistent uh, for for this season. Uh, can they run the ball consistently? Uh, I know they have on Johnson who had his issues, but I know they picked up Adrian Peterson. How much he's going to be used, I don't know. We shall see. But you still have, have Kenny Dick Galladay and Marvin Jones as their wide receiving core, which is not bad, but we'll see. Like I said before, uh, it's all about Matthew Stafford staying healthy. If he stays healthy, Detroit does have a shot. 
If he does, it's just like last year, they'll be on the outside looking in. My my uh, <clears throat> second wild card team coming out. My my third wild card team coming out of this division will be the Chicago Bears. I'm taking my hat off. And, uh, let me explain why. I think this defense will be better than ever. Khalil Mack is coming back to have a monster, a healthy. Uh, whoever the quarterback is for the Bears, uh, if they can um, uh, catch momentum and start winning games, I believe that can happen. Whoever's that will be, will be healthy when he comes back in a couple of weeks. So I think the Bears, uh, they can win this division. I'm not going to bet on it, but I think they'll get enough to a car spot. As far as the Green Bay Packers is concerned, uh, as I said last year, you saw the beginning of the end for the Packers. Uh, this was one of those years last year that every, every break went in their favor. Now Aaron Rodgers is upset because uh, they drafted Jordan Love, even though he's not the uh, backup quarterback now. Um, Matt LaFleur uh, um, had the offensive game plan as far as running the ball last year, taking the ball out of Rodgers' hands. Of course, Rodgers didn't like it, but you didn't hear it too much because they were winning. I think ugly heads were rolling Green Bay. Uh, it, it, it's going to be a rough year for the guy, for the Chiefs heads up north. I had them out of the playoffs. So once again, my NFC North winner is the Minnesota Vikings. My last wild card spot will go to the Chicago Bears. Okay, so I too have Minnesota win the division. For all the reasons you said, Sid, I mean, you got Dalvin Cook. Hopefully he can stay healthy. Adam Thielen, hopefully he can stay healthy. Justin Jefferson from LSU. He was one of Joe Burrow's top yeah. targets last year. I think that'll definitely help, you know, maybe that'll help sort of stave off the loss of Stefan Diggs. Mm -hmm. uh, Kyle Rudolph, I know he's getting up there, but he's still very reliable and sort of like, you know, that, that, that big, strong tight ends, you know, another one of those top strong tight ends. That defense is really good too. You know, Gagulier, they got from Jacksonville. I think that definitely helps that front seven. Mm -hmm. Helps with that re replacing Emerson, Everson Griffin. Also, Anthony Barr, I think that helps too. Um, if Harrison Smith is still there as well. I, I think, look, I think Minnesota top to bottom has like the better, the best roster of everybody in that, in that division. So I think they'll win 10 or 11. I think that'll be enough for them to win the division. The Bears will come in second place, but I think they'll just miss the playoffs. Look, like I said before, the defense is good enough for them to keep them, is great to keep them in games. We'll see if Hicks can still stay healthy. If they, the health, that was a big problem. If Khalil Mack can stay healthy. I know getting Robert Quinn, we'll see how much he has left in the tank. You know, Rokron mm -hmm. Smith, we'll see if, you know, he can get to that next level. And also, Deidre Rathen, you know, he's getting up there, but we'll see how much he has left. That office is, that office still bothers me. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it does. And I'm hoping that Al Robinson get the numbers that he he needs and wants to get that big contract. I know they got Ted Ginn Jr. I don't people forget if you forgot that <laughs> he's he's a bear now. Um, Jimmy Graham, I'm not expecting much from him. I think Cole Komet was will eventually end up being like getting a lot of the reps. That that O line still concerns me too. So I think the Bears will win nine. I got the Bears at nine and seven, but I think they'll just miss the playoffs. Uh, the Packers, I think, for all the reasons you said, Sid, I don't – I think it has a little role in Green Bay. I think Aaron Rodgers still has that bad taste in his mouth, even though he makes it facade-wise. He makes it look like it, he's fine with it, but I don't think he is. They still got Aaron Jones and Devontae Adams. Mercedes Lewis, we'll see how much he has left in the tank. The defense was okay, but not great. You got, you got Zedaria Smith and Jair Alexander. Um – but I, I think they'll finish nine and seven too. But I think they'll miss the playoffs. Detroit, I think they'll they'll I think they'll finish just like right at five hundred. They'll, they'll just miss the playoffs at seven to nine. But they'll probably end up winning a couple of division games that you probably didn't think they could win. So I have Minnesota winning that division and no no wild card spots for any of the other three. Yeah. Before we move on to college football, uh, breaking news: the Bears have placed Andy Pinero, the kicker, on IR. Carol Santos will replace uh, Panero to start the season. This is my, this is my, <laughs> this is me and shrugging. I mean, I don't know what to say. I, I, <laughs> I just don't know what to say. I mean, the, the, the kicking, that kicking thing is becoming a big problem again for the Bears. Go figure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So those are our predictions. Again, don't take them at face value. You can come back and if we are terrible at it, hopefully we can get Jason's picks at some point, but uh yeah, those are ours, and, you know, 
follow our advice or not, I, I would recommend you <laughs> the latter that you don't, but <laughs> we'll see. Uh, all right, let's go to the college gridiron real quick. Sid, um, did you watch any of the games? I watched a couple of the games, but it kind of felt, it felt kind of weird because Look, I mean, the the, uh, the Arkansas State Memphis game was actually pretty interesting, but you know, what, what, did you did you did you watch any college football this weekend? Be honest with you, no. I did turn to BYU and Navy last night for like a minute. I know the the score was lopsided, but I was looking to see if, if there were fans in the stands. Of course, there weren't, but uh, they both teams were shaking hands and high fiving at the end of the game. I was like, I don't know if they were supposed to do that or not, but I found I found that kind of interesting. So, but outside of that, I really didn't check out any college football. No, this was supposed to have been the the weekend of where college football really started. Of course, we all know why we don't have to go through that again. But outside of that, I didn't check out too much college football. I, I know it's going to be different for this year, but I didn't get a chance to check it outside the, the two minutes I watched from BYU and Navy last night. Like I said, I watched, I watched a little bit of Arkansas State Memphis. That was a very interesting and uh, very intriguing mm-hmm. game. Uh, there was another team with Southern Miss. Actually, Frank, Frank Gore's son plays for Southern Miss. Get ready to feel old, folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I said, get ready to feel old, kids. Uh, I watched a little bit of that game. Um I really didn't, didn't catch too much of it. I mean, you, you've seen – I've seen some teams have had to postpone some of their games. I think Rice had to postpone, like, three – like, their first two games because of positive tests and, like, some other – there was another game this weekend that's supposed to have been happening, but I guess, like, one team has positive tests, so they can't play. I know uh, you, you, UCF, they've had, like, 12 players opt out. So, you know, that's still – I, I said, I don't know about you. I know we've been talking about this for months, but – you know, Clemson and Wake, they play each other, but when you see, like, you know, some team, some teams, and also even more players are starting to opt out, do you think they'll be able to pull this off? I don't know. Like you said, uh, more players are opting out, so I, I know you had to have so many uh, kids on scholarship to play, but uh, it's going to be tough. I, I, uh, good luck to, the, to these conferences uh, trying to pull it off. I know there was one game that was supposed to start next, uh, this coming weekend, but because of COVID concerns, they had to be pushed back another week. So I, the more these situations keep happening, uh, it's going to be tough to pull off. It's only a matter of time before you keep pushing things back, pushing things back, and you just go ahead to hold it off until the spring. Yeah, I mean, it, it's getting – yeah, it's getting – it seems like it's getting worse before it seems getting better. I mean – yeah. Know, some games have come – have gone off without a hitch, but at the same time, though, like you said, Sid, there have been – there were a couple of games that were supposed to start. I know ESPN was supposed to. I saw um, Molly, Molly McGrath, who does a great reporter, doing great job doing the sidelines for ESPN, their college football and college mm-hmm. basketball coverage. I know that they were, she was supposed to have been doing a game. Let me see. Uh, oh, Oklahoma State and Tulsa. Tulsa, Tulsa has some positive drug tests, so they've had, to, they've had to postpone that game. So, like you said, so it, I, I, don't, mm-hmm. I can't see how they pull this off. I'm going to be honest. Yeah, good luck to them. And not to be sarcastic, but it is really tough. Also, um, Panay Sewell, who was one of, if you guys haven't heard the name, he's one of the top um, offensive linemen for Oregon. He's decided to opt out. He's going to concentrate on the NFL draft. So we're seeing more and more of some of these top players deciding to opt out. So I, I said, I don't, I don't know. I mean, look, like you said, I mean, you know, more power to them. They can pull this off, but I don't, it doesn't look mm-hmm. like. So far, it's not going to happen. Yeah, you just did the worst thing out of my mouth. <laughs> All right. So, anything else? Anything else, sir? That's on your mind before we end? Uh, just a couple of days away from football between Houston and Kansas City. As of right now, Kansas City is supposed to have sixteen thousand or has spread it out over what fans wear that mask. Um. Outside of that, um, I'm looking forward to the Sox and the Cubs both continuing their winning ways as far as baseball is concerned. But I'm, I'm just waiting for football to be here. It's going to be different, at least at the start of the season, because of the pandemic we're in right now. Uh, uh, most of these stands will not have fans. So we, we're going to see them perhaps uh, later on in the season. Outside of that, I'm just ready for football. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to go here. Yeah, it seems like football kind of snuck up on everybody. <laughs> it seems yeah. like- but you know what, though? 
but you know what though i think it's you know i think it's great i think look a lot of us didn't think we would make it here so i'm i'm yeah. good i mean i'm looking forward to these games like i said well we'll get more in depth on friday but i'm looking forward to these games because this, this is going to be some good games and yeah the look and the feel of it's going to be very different but i i think look i think this is come hell or high water nfl's going to going to find a way to pull off at least so far so far so good knock on wood i don't have my end table over my bedside table over here. <laughs> 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 when it would. So hopefully they hopefully nothing big drastic happens and hopefully they can do this without a hitch. But sounds it look, it looks we'll see. It's gonna look different because like you said, some some arenas will be able to have fans, some will not. I know the Chiefs will have fans in their stand, so it's gonna be interesting. Couple of sports shout outs, authentic wins, the Kentucky Derby. So that was a that was a uh, interesting it three ways. Also, Dustin Johnson, he wins his it's hard to believe his first ever FedEx Cup championship. He wins the tour championship, you know, pulling away and fifteen million dollar purse, Sid. So not bad. <laughs> and also, you know, Wingfoot, you know, the US Open starts in, the, in a few weeks, so I'm sure he'll definitely be one of the favorites. He's been playing very well lately, and I and I think he I think he might win it. Yeah, let's see what happens there. All right, we'll see. Um, tennis, you know, the U.S. Open, you know, Jen Brady has become like the Cinderella story for the U.S. I mean, she's now in the quarters. So, you know, looking at that, and also you got to think that it's going to be a collision course between um, Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka. We'll see how that plays out. I'm waiting for that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, right? I mean, It'll be interesting to see, you know, how all that. I mean, Serena's got a tough draw. As so does, um, so does uh, uh, Naomi. She plays actually another fellow American, Shelby Rogers. Another one has been playing very well. So we'll see. Also on the men's side, it's pretty much wide open. You know, no Djokovic. So it's all it's a free for all, folks. So any you know, look for, I'm sure you know, Andre Zverev and Dominic Thiem, guys that have been knocking on the door for the last few years. Also, Dmitry Medvedev. I mean, it could be one of those three guys that finally go th break through and you know get their first Grand Slam. Yeah, we always see the same two guys from the on the men's side. This, like you said, this is a wide open spot. Well, let's see who gets it. Yeah, should be. Yeah, should be fun. I mean, I, I think. Look, I, I'm not going to make predictions because I think any one of those guys could win it, and I think they mm -hmm. see, see their opportunity. So, should be fun on the men's side. All right, so. On that note, you can follow me at Keena McGee on Twitter, at Keena underscore McGee on the Instagram. You can follow me, Sid the Kid, at SidKid80 on Twitter and Instagram. Once again, at SidKid80 on Twitter and Instagram. That's S-I-D-K-I-D-8-0. That's S-I-D-K-I-D-8-0. You can read all of my articles at WeAreRegalRadio.com. That's W-E-A-R-E-R-E-G-A-L Radio.com. And you can follow this show, Sega City Sports, and all of our uh, uh, podcast programming from We Are Regal Radio on Anchor. That's War on Anchor, which kicks you over to Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, iTunes, Apple. We're everywhere. Wherever you download your podcast, make sure you look up War on Anchor. Also, don't forget to download the iHeartRadio app and search for War on Anchor. That's W-A-R-R -R, on Anchor, and you can access all of our programming there as well. Also, we're on YouTube. So, where can we find them? Where can they find us on YouTube, Sid? War Media. That's W A R R Media. And make sure you check out all of our videos. You see our, our lovely places. Voila! Make sure you like the page, like, share, subscribe, and get the likes up. Get them up. Get them up. Get them up. Yes, yes, yes. So, a lot of you know. Guess okay. One more question, right before before we uh before we uh, depart here. Do you think there's been too much sports? No. I know, right. But for people, oh, there's too much sports going on. Look, we haven't had sports for like four months, so come on, folks. Thank you. <laughs> come on now. I'm, I'm happy now. I, 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 listen, I, I just, I'm going to turn on the, um, the England-Denmark-UEFA Nations League match. So <laughs> it's, it's on ESPN2 right now. So I'm going to mm -hmm. check that out. So we got you know, football. We got basketball tennis is finishing up too so come on guys we can never have too much sports come on all right for Sid, exactly all right for Sid I'm like mm, excuse me for Sid I'm like here this is second City sports zoom style and we'll see you Friday talk to you next time holla